Thank you to everyone for coming out to this live recording. As Ben said, we have a very special guest, President Mary Daly with us. Not only is she the president and CEO of the San Francisco Fed, she is a voting member of the FOMC, and that's why all these fine folks are here with us today. <laughs> um, she also is a 28-year veteran of the Federal Reserve System, so she brings a wealth of experience, knowledge, and insights to some of the questions we want to talk about today. So thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's nice to be live. Well, it's great to have you here. and. I'm excited to get into discussing monetary policy, Fed policy with you. Uh, before we do that, though, you have an amazing journey, your story. You overcome a lot. I'll just throw out a few quick facts. You dropped out of high school. You worked retail paycheck to paycheck. You went back and got your GED. You got a PhD. And here you are, a Fed president. So that's quite a story. And there's a lot to learn from that, lessons you could probably share with us. So you've seen it on that side. You've also seen it from the side of a president hiring people. Uh, a lot of grad students, young people here, people who listen, who are thinking about a career in economics. What would you share with them based on that experience? Well, I have had a very different path, but I, I reject the idea that it was crooked. Maybe it was exactly the way it was supposed to be. I think, And I think that's a really important message. That's why I say it, because so many people, young people, all kinds of people, but especially young people think they need a, a linear path and that is the right path. And any movement off of a linear path is a mistake, a failure, a stop and go, and that's completely wrong. If you ask most CEOs in the nation, they will tell you some version of a crooked path story that they got into something, they moved over there. And it reminds us all that you know the thing we think we want to do when we graduate from school and we might even get a job in that environment may not be the exact thing we end up doing or that we find our passions and our talents meet. I mean, you have to have the passion for something and the talent and that has to marry. And then you want to take it alignment with your values. And if you put all those three things together, well, then it's almost impossible to think you'll hit the ground running with your first experience. So as David said, my first jobs were in in retail, I drove a donut truck. I, you know, I had, uh, no, I really did. I drove the all night donut truck and delivering flour and things. And I worked at Target and I worked at a deli called Ruma's Deli. And I used to go by a billboard while I was driving the donut truck and it said, be a bus driver. Because if you're a bus driver, you get, you're in a union and you get benefits. It's only also one job. And I thought, well, if I can drive a donut truck, I could surely drive a bus. Um, it's harder than you think, actually. <laughs> but the, um, but, the, tr but the, the thing that is true is that then I had a meeting with who turned out to be my mentor. She was in her early 30s at the time, Betsy. She says, you know, you can't get a bus driver job unless you get a GED. And so I got a GED, and that was just serendipity, right? I get the GED to be a bus driver, but the GED then opens up an opportunity to get a semester in college, which I had never heard of, really. I'm sure there were people around me who had been to college, your teachers and things. I didn't know that. And the only person I ever knew had really gone to college, took a community college degree in court reporting. And I remember she had to sit in front of this tiny little machine and practice endlessly on that thing. And I said, no way, I'm not going to college. Um, but then, you know, ultimately my mind opens. I end up at a four-year degree and I end up here today. And so what my journey, the main message of my journey that I will impart to all of you in the room is you don't get where you are despite things. You get where you are because of things. So treat each of the little things you do, even if they seem sideways or backwards to others, as an integral part of who you're going to become, how you will lead, how you will contribute. and. That's the narrative. You, you're in control of your own narrative, and I think it's really important for me uh, to impart that to you. You won't always know it at the time. There's a lot of external pressure that sometimes comes your way, but ultimately owning that narrative and, and realizing you get there because of what you do, not despite it, is, is the important thing to, to remember. Great advice. And I will note that I got the chance to speak with President Daly before this for a few minutes and learned that she does many other things outside of economics. She's an artist, a metal artist. Um, what was the other artist? I paint, I, paint. Um, I weld, make welded sculpture. Yeah. And here's an important fact about that. It is a hobby, I do love it, but I have no formal training. I mean, I did take welding classes. I would go, and because you have to use the big welding things, and that's it's dangerous if you don't know how to do it. But you know, I taught myself how to paint. And the, one of the things that I have learned is in your professional life, 
you obviously want to devote a lot of time to getting the skills that you need to make the contributions. In your personal life, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good or the fun. Do what you like. Nobody cares. You're not going to be, you know, getting a, you're not going to make a living out of it usually. So just enjoy it. doesn't matter if you're good at it. And uh, President Daly has agreed to come back on at a later date to talk about her hobbies, special bonus episode of Macro Musing. So, so stay tuned, uh, and we, we will get back to you on that. You'll find out how, we got, how I got to these hobbies. Yes, yes, <laughs> great story. But let, let's go to monetary policy okay. so, and the economy. So something that's happened, as we all know, is that inflation was really high, but it's come down dramatically since 2022, although recently it's been a lot more sticky, a little more stubborn. Stubborn. I like stubborn. Okay, stubborn. And you are a voting member of the FOMC. You're thinking about this. How has this past year changed, these past few months, changed your outlook on monetary policy, the expectation of rate cuts sure. going forward? So I think it's really important answering this question about three months of data to just back up and roll back to last year. First of last year, inflation was still printing high. You know, there was a considerable amount of concern that I had and other committee members had that we were really going to have to put the, raise the interest rate even higher than it is now to try to get a hold of this. And that didn't materialize, of course, because inflation came down rapidly at the second half of last year. And that gives people a lot of optimism. But myself, I didn't read as much as others, not other committee members, markets would be an example. I didn't, you know, I just smoothed through that got to stay steady in the boat. So inflation's going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to come down rapidly sometimes, maybe get stubborn in, in three months. And before we can jump to the conclusion that, you know, if we had jumped to the conclusion last year that we were on a downward trajectory and everything was golden, I, I think you've probably heard all of us, but me, I, I said it repeatedly, we can't declare victory. It's far too early to declare victory. And the three months that we've just seen is why you don't declare victory before you get confidence. So at the beginning of the, this year, you know, the confidence bands, think of the, let's think of this confidence bands that you have. You have confidence bands around projections. Well, the confidence bands coming out of last year and into the, as we start the year, they looked like they were tightening up, getting more confidence that inflation's coming down. And what the last three months of data have done is widened those confidence bands back out. So there, there's considerable now uncertainty about what the next uh, few months of inflation will be and what we should do, do in response. The important thing that I go back to is the reaction to uncertainty, to me, isn't to make more projections <laughs> with definitiveness. I just say that the confidence bands have widened and we are now prepared, I am prepared, to think about through the scenario. So scenario, the, a scenario that would be a very nice scenario is inflation got a little bit of a slow start, but it continues to come down because the labor market is, is starting to slow, the economy is slowing. We see a, a, a kind of a continuation of what we saw at the second half of last year. If that happens, then of course, starting to normalize the policy rate would be appropriate. But if we get a different scenario where inflation stays you know, level just doesn't make much further progress, then, you know, then it's not appropriate to start adjusting the rate unless we see the labor market faltering, which it's not showing any signs of doing. So that's a scenario. So that there's a range of scenarios under which you would do a, a different policy actions. And I think the, the best way I can talk to people is to go through those scenarios and really reveal the reaction function as opposed to trying to get a probability uh, statistic on something where really what's happened is the uncertainty bands have widened. Okay, sounds very data dependent. It is data dependent, and it's interesting. Data dependence is, has been, I think, there's not a clear narrative of what data dependence means. Uh -huh. Let me be as clear as I possibly can be. It is not a backward-looking variable. So yes, the information that's coming in that you know comes in and we everybody looks at it is an input to the process, but that input isn't definitive because things can happen so you have to that's one leg of the stool because our if you take the data and you put it into our models and theories and things you can you can project out but there's other legs to that stool which is what's happening in real time week to week what do you see going on in terms of price increases that that people are making and what are our contacts telling us you know reserve bank presidents in particular spend a lot of time out in what we would call the field talking to businesses and uh, small, medium, and large businesses, unions, you know, different kinds of worker groups, communities. And we're asking firms in particular, are you raising prices? Do you think you're going to pass through? Do you think about 
you know, is this a slowing inflation? What are your input prices? What are your forward contracts looking like? That gives us that data dependence that we see. And so far, that's why I say there's just a lot of uncertainty because we're getting some different signals. You know, firms are saying, I don't think I'm going to be able to pass this much through. Consumers are getting more choosy about uh, looking for bargains. And but my input prices aren't going down quite yet, so I'm in a wait and see mode. And that's that coupled with the, the stubbornness of the last three months of data means that the uncertainty bands are wider. So you have the largest district in the Federal Reserve System. So I, I just can imagine all the trips you have to make through that district to get this I am data. a well-traveled uh, citizen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, going to the other part of the monetary policy that we think of, and that's the balance sheet. And there was a big announcement, big change, uh, at least a reduction in how quickly you will reduce the balance sheet, or roll it over. So what are your thoughts on that? Does, does that signal anything about the stance of monetary no. policy? Okay. Hard no. No signal about the stance of monetary policy. This is it's tr- truly something we had already set out in our principles and our, our talk discussions you know, over a year ago about how we would do balance sheet runoff. So the idea is always to get back to a level that is ample reserves. That's the regime that we're running to, to conduct monetary policy. But as you, if you roll back to September of 2019, uh, you recall, if you were there paying, a, you know, paying attention at that point in time, that we were running the balance sheet down, and then we ran into, in uh, balance sheet lingo, the kink of the reserves demand supply. And we ran into that and that caused market volatility. You want to avoid that, right? Our goal isn't to create market volatility that has literally nothing to do with the stance of policy. So we always had uh, forecast and uh, communicated that we would um, decrease the pace of runoff as we got nearer to ample and we would do it well in advance of being at that place so that we could make sure we don't run into that place again. But the benefit of doing it this way is that you then don't have to stop short of getting to ample. The goal is always to get to that level that's ample, but if we we found ourselves in a disruption, we might have to start stop short of getting to that what is really truly ample. So this is a way to get a smooth landing on that, and it has nothing to do with the stance of monetary policy. Stance of monetary policy is all about the funds rate and any forward guidance we have given, and the forward guidance right now, as you know, which I think is very frustrating for many people. Not, I don't think people in the economy as much as, um, sorry, I'm looking over at the, the media core, a uh, media core who wants to know exactly what we're doing or markets. But essentially, it is true that a projection, a, a strong forward guidance at this point, other than here's what we do under these scenarios, isn't actually going to lead to you know, better outcomes because we don't know how the economy is going to evolve. We only know how we would react to the evolution of the economy. Okay. So the Fed has a dual mandate. So we've been talking a lot about the inflation side. There's also the employment side. So you feel pretty good about that, the risk there? Any, any chance that you keep rates too high for too long and you begin to jeopardize that side or you feel it's a good balance between well, the two? As you might imagine, as a labor economist by training and just a policymaker who holds both sides of that dual mandate, at the top of my mind, laser focused on the employment part, the because the risks have become come into better balance. You know, when inflation's printing at the high sixes and sevens, and the labor market's going strong, well, then we obviously need to turn our attention to the inflation side. It's so far away from our goals. But as inflation's come down and the labor market is slowed, then both of the the risks are more balanced, and we have to keep our eye on both sides of the mandate. Now, right now, I don't see any evidence that the labor market is approaching a worrisome position. But, you know, we did see initial claims rise today. We saw the labor market report uh, come in weaker than expectations, still strong relative to what people think is the study state level of job growth. But there is there there is evidence already out there that firms are a little more picky about hiring and many firms especially in tech for instance which is dominant in the in the west they're rebalancing their portfolios of employees and so that's something we have to watch but today no i see a really healthy labor market where people who want a job can get one what i see is we still have inflation too high and that's creating some uncertainty for people about are we really going to bring it down and the main message there is absolutely over time down to 2% is our goal. We're resolute to keep it. All right, 2% it is. What about our star? I want to come to this. Oh, I be- love our star. Okay, so our star is the natural or equilibrium interest rate, the one that would clear the economy on a sustainable path. Um, 
there's a lot of discussion about where is it going. So you know, put aside the, the near term, but long term, sure. are we at a place that's different than, say, pre-2020 when our star was viewed as really low? I mean, demo, there's a couple of things you could look at. Demographics, that seems to be very similar to what it was before. If anything, maybe even worse because the aging planet's still with us, which would – I know you can take two views on this, but push down our star. Um, also, some people worry about fiscal deficits pushing mm-hmm. up, up our, our star. star. And I know that's beyond your, your policy purview, but you have to at least respond to it when you see it happening. And the, another area would be AI or productivity. And I, I will tie it to AI. I want to spend more time on AI later in our conversation. But you know, AI, in theory, could be raising productivity, pushing up our star. So where do you see us going like over the mid to long term horizon with our star? Sure. It's a, it's a terrific question and one that really I was uh, – I was just talking to a group of economists at uh, Stanford and I, at, a, at an event we were doing, and I said, you know, academics would really help if we could all just pitch in and study the, some of the fundamental things we're grappling with. One of them is what's happening with our star. And the truth is we don't know. You name the things that could affect it, but we don't really have a good sense of where those things are heading. For my own views, I've put in, you know, if you come, came in pre-pandemic, just thinking about the consensus estimates, 0.5 for the real R star, for, for R star, the real neutral interest rate, was about right. And so that put the nominal neutral at 2.5, 2% inflation, 0.5 uh, R star. That is, in all likelihood, gone up a little bit. And so then you ask, well, by how much? And what's a good assessment? And so I've really got a ban for myself of between 0.5 and 1%. And then if you think about where we are with policy and you use that one instead of the 0.5, you said, okay, I'm just going to be thinking it went up for all the reasons you named. Well, you still have restrictive policy. And if you look at a, a, gra- a diagram of, of time series, the only time we've had more restrictive policy is really in the, in the Volcker disinflation. Otherwise, we still have very – we have restrictive policy, which is what we want to have at this point. So I think the R-star conversation is, in, is important, and all of the factors you named will influence it. But it's, I don't feel the press to, to know exactly what it is today because we don't have the research yet to really think about that. And what's important for monetary policy today is are we restrictive? And clearly even under that higher estimate of our star, we are restrictive. But it might take more time to just bring inflation down. So when I think about the, the factors affecting it, I, I think you're right, it's, it's demographics, it's uh, – fiscal positions of, of it, because our star, we talk about it locally, as in domestically, but it's really a global variable because these financial markets are global. And so you have to look at what other countries are facing as well. And, and other countries are facing the same demographics, some idea that productivity growth might be stronger for the reasons you mentioned. And a lot of deficit and, and, and now debt from the pandemic and trying to get right-sized after that. And all of those things have to play out, and it just really depends on how they evolve, particularly productivity and, and fiscal. Well, I was hopeful that productivity uh, will continue to go up. There's been a surge. <laughs> One of your economists, Andrew Forrester, Forrester, yeah. Forrester, he had a little post that he has this probability model. He does have a probability he, model. he's like, uh, it's, not, it's not happening, folks. Don't, don't get too excited about it. But <laughs> I want to believe. I want to believe that productivity is going to go up. The AI is making a difference. And we just had a conversation with my boss, Tyler Cowan, in here the other day, yesterday, in fact. And AI is very interesting because on one hand, you could see it improving productivity, pushing up our star. It would be a great world to live in. Um, on the other hand, AI, and this is something Tyler mentioned, could cause us to live longer, too. It could help find cure diseases, live to 100 years old. That would increase this, this issue of demographics, having to save more for longer lives. So you could see... AI, depending on the magnitude, is going both ways. But I want to segue into a broader discussion of AI because you have talked about this a lot. You're from Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI and its long-term impact on the economy, on labor markets? So let me think about it. There's a lot in there, so I'm trying to uh, think about all of those aspects of it. But let me think first, step back and say, you know, the bottom line on AI and what its impact will be on the economy, the labor market is – that's going to be up to us. So the most important thing to know about technologies is they don't, it, technologies don't make decisions. People make decisions. Societies make decisions. So if we get to 10 years from now and say this didn't work out like we want, we can't blame technology. We have to think about where we could have done something different. So I think one of the 
few the things I think that is very encouraging is you're already seeing conversations at firms, but importantly among workers. You know, whether they're in a union or not, they're thinking about what's the impact of this on the labor force and and maybe the healthcare system. How do we get better? But also, how do we utilize the the folks we have and the people who should be integrated into the economy. So stepping back from that, then what are my ideas? Well, you know, I came up to the Fed, you mentioned I'm a 28 year veteran. Okay, so I started the Fed in 1996, I'm a rookie economist. I got my PhD, went to a postdoc, came to the Fed. So I'm at the Fed and my early interactions are with Chairman Greenspan's staff calling me saying, because I'm in the, the, look, I'm in charge of like going to Silicon Valley, looking in Seattle and seeing what's going on and are people investing in this and what's happening. And, you know, it, it, the famous Bob Solo quote of you see productivity everywhere except in the productivity statistics, that was really true in the late 90s. You weren't measuring it yet. We started to measure it at, after the real-time data came out, but you could see it everywhere. And I remember so clearly two things that made me completely understand that this was going to be transformative in terms of the productivity. One was went to Salt Lake City and they were installing uh, meter, meters on the, on the houses that could be read from the truck so that they didn't get bitten by dogs and they didn't have, you know, they couldn't read them and didn't people have bills they didn't want. And so they had just invested in this. And so we went and asked them, why did you invest now? And here's the three things they told us. Well, the technology is available. Uh, the labor market is tight, and so it's really hard to get meter readers. And this seems like it's going to be transformative and live for decades. And so I thought, okay, those three ingredients that Salt Lake City did, and then also you go somewhere, this tourist, I mean, this um, uh, luggage company was doing the same thing. They used to hand inspect all the suitcases, and they built a machine that could inspect the quality of the suitcases so they would know if it's going to break. And that was all done by computers. And so now you had one person sitting in the back figuring out all of this and sorting them. And, and those things about business processes, the investments in the technology, but also the tight labor market was sort of the forcing function to get businesses moving on this because computers have been around for a long time. I see similar elements today. So you talk, we do these round tables, we talk to businesses, all kinds of businesses, small, medium, and large, manufacturing, retail, are already using AI. Whether they're buying an off the, taking an off-the-shelf product or having something built for themselves, depending on their size, they're using it. But they're using it because they're facing really you know, a long period of tight labor markets, and they wanted technologies that make the work more interesting and more sustainable for people. Take the, what do they call it, the soul-sucking work. They wanted to remove the soul-sucking work and leave people with better work. But they're already in conversations with their workers about, okay, what is this gonna look like in terms of new jobs at it and things, because there is this existential threat that workers feel about, is this gonna take my, my, my job? So I am, more optimistic than Andrew Forrester, my colleague. But what he's doing is say he's reminding us of a simple thing that we should not, hope can't be enough to get us past his model. His model and countless other models like his would really say the following. It's really hard to move from a average level of productivity or what he calls the low productivity state, which is 1.5% for the US, to something more like what we saw in the late 90s and early 2000s. Those are just not that frequent, these big jumps. So we can't bet, as a policymaker, I can't bet on productivity growth saving us from uh, inflation. That's, but I absolutely am there watching. And if we see the signs that we're observing in small areas start to scale up, and it shows through to the productivity statistics, let me just say, I wouldn't be surprised. So don't count on it, but look for it. Okay, so we are very AI bullish here at Mercatus. So we talk a lot about it. We have a program, we have some scholars here who work on it. Um, you should come to the West Coast. Well, we, I, I, know our, I know Tyler, our colleague in, in Boston, does take a lot of trips out there to Silicon Valley. Um, we, we even have used it in the monetary policy program, believe it or not. And I believe, I believe uh, one of your colleagues used it to prepare for this trip out here. Uh, we have something called the Macro Muse Bot, so check it out, listeners, if you haven't already. Um, but we have fed in you know, 400 plus episodes uh, that we've done. It's built on an existing brand, I think Claude 3. So you can ask it anything about the show, about people, ideas, things we've talked about. And it, it hit me, you know, it, if you take that, which knows me, my mannerisms, my thinking pretty well, take my voice, I could easily be replaced by, you know, an AI version of David Beckworth for this podcast. 
Not really, though. I Not mean, really? I think I think that you, the the distance between that and and where we are today is is pretty large because it is missing some element, right? So it can do things, right? We could, if you were sick, we could get something out of that. But you have this way of doing things that I think would be hard for the current Gen AI products to to do, which is if a person throws out a question, uh, throws out an answer, you can think, you can respond and get the most interesting thread as opposed to the one that the model might have trained it to ask next. So it can go off script, but it's always going to ask something which has been previously fed into the model. And you're going to say something like, oh, you like football? Uh, which are, what are your teams, you know? And I don't think that if, it, 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 unless lots of other guests had said they liked football and your, rea- your reaction was, what are your teams, then it would be hard pressed to do that. So I, there's, there's a way in which I think it's the responsibility of all of us, since you all are doing this here in Bercatus, I'm certainly doing this, to help educate people that the existential risk of complete replacement is not a current risk of complete replacement. You know, one of the things I'm more bullish on with AI, truth will tell us, is that technologies on net never reduce employment. But there's a big gap between when they replace jobs, when they augment jobs, and when, they, when it creates jobs. And that leaves people left out and feeling like, well, wait, I was replaced. But AI is unusual in that the firms we're going to anyway, which is a large number of them, are saying that they're using it to replace certain tasks, which they collectively say are the soul-sucking tasks, then the, they're, but they're augmenting work right away. And then they're building new people into their workforce because they need prompt engineers and other people to, to help with the model. So uh, one of my uh, firms is a re- was big retail uh, group, has a lot of copy editors writing copy for things that range from a 50 cent screw for, a, for something that they make to you know, a $700 high-end product. The copywriters, and this is going to be shocking to you, they don't actually like to write about the screws. It's not very interesting, it's tedious, but they love writing about the other items. Well, it turns out the firm's incentives are for the copywriters to write about the expensive items, which have high margin, and not about the screws. So the Gen AI product writes about the screws, and they have an auditor, and now they're orders of magnitude, happier copywriters, and more output, and accurate descriptions of screws, which is, I think, a win-win-win. Well, I'm glad my job is secure. So thank you're you. okay. Thank you you're totally much. okay. And we're AI bullish. I'm kind of just throwing out, you know, as an example, because I, I want to throw out another possibility here. Since we're talking about the Fed, and I have an FOMC member with me, but imagine in the distant future we make use of big data, AI. What does the Fed look like? Would it be a much less labor-intensive organization, more AI, fewer economists, people? In, you still do the same thing. You still maybe have big balance sheets. Do follow some version of a Taylor rule, but could you foresee a future where there's much more AI-intensive use at the Fed? So one thing that is maybe little known but certainly important is that, you know, we, like all other research institutes, you know, we've got a whole group of researchers. We also have, we have three responsibilities, as you know, the payments, monetary policy, payment system, monetary policy, uh, financial system. And we've been using, like all other groups have, big data for a long time, right? It's been around, it's not a new thing. Generative AI started uh, around Thanksgiving uh, of 2022, but not machine learning, not the use of big data. So, of course, we're using that to get insights and lessons. But those are just, they're generating patterns that have happened before and looking for patterns in the existing information. So they point you to things, but they don't replace thinking. And so I, st- I still think that you know the Fed will look different, like all institutions will, in terms of how it does its work and does more hopefully effectively and efficiently and much more information that can be collected and used in real time to generate ideas and things. But ultimately, there's still the judgment part to how you think about things because you, you're also bringing in the qualitative information and we have to be out in the field talking about that with individuals and bringing that in and balancing the qualitative information with the quantitative information with the history, models, and empirical work is still not, I mean, much like you, I, I don't see uh, a, a machine replacing that. But it also kind of underscores that the Fed is not just technocrats. 
It's uh, actually individuals with judgment and things like your job is not just being a, you know, you're not just getting questions, reading them and getting that. You're interacting and those interactions are interesting and useful for for listeners, hopefully. Um, Say yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) This is a big nod. I'm doing that kind of thing, like nod yes. Okay, well, let's move on to another topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the Fed's framework review, which starts the second half of this year, goes into next year. Uh, maybe give us the basic contours of it. When is it going to happen? And then what do you, would you like to have happen, and what do you think will happen at it? Okay, so the first thing I'll say is that we haven't really announced yet. I'm going to let the chair do that. And so I don't want to front run the committee about when okay. we'll, uh, what the parameters of the framework will be and, and the specifics. But what I will say is the last framework review was very intensive, if you remember it. And if you don't remember it, it really had many components to it. So one component, of course, which you saw reflected in the minutes and eventually you'll, in the transcripts, was just the, the study of what are all the different ways you can go, um, what could, how would we do this well, what are the facts that are pre- present today and are likely to be present for the next five years that we should really think about. It. Because remember, at the time we did our last framework review, Uh, we couldn't get inflation up to target. So there was a lot of conversations about what do we do in a low R-star world? We're going to hit the ZLB or the zero lower bound regularly. What happens when inflation doesn't get up to target, not only in our country, but other countries? So that's a, those are risks that we have to manage. So I suspect that at this point, some of the questions that that will come out and i'm again don't want i'm not front running the the committee i'm just saying what is on the minds i have this written on my whiteboard it's a good study for academics too so here's some questions that are really important are we going to be in fighting inflation from a below our target or above our target so last framework review the world was thinking we're going to fight inflation from below our target whatever the given target is Now, I think there's a real conversation out there about whether we're going to be fighting inflation regularly from above the target, pulling it down. Well, that has different implications for for any kind of a framework or what the Fed, how the Fed and other central banks react. The other one you already mentioned is what's going, what is, what's, where is our star headed? Is, are the same things that we came into the pandemic with still salient or have they changed in a fundamental way that means that the zero lower bound is not going to be as Uh, pervasively um, hit as it was before that? Is it something different? And I think the third one is, and this is, we also touched up on this with AI, but I think it's different than that, is what does potential output look like? So if you remember prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about secular stagnation, that the global economy was simply going to have a slow growth environment. You just weren't be able to, the pie wasn't going to expand. We weren't going to be able to offset, you know, recessions because we were at the zero lower bound and inflation was just going to drift. Now the world seems to be, we've got AI potentially boosting potential output growth. We have, is inflation really going to be coming down? And then R star, is it higher? Those are all fundamental questions that any central bank has to grapple with. And so the framework is, is certainly going to have to live in that context. And then of course, talk about you know the tools and, and the techniques we use. Um, but you know certain things stay stay the same. And what's really important is, everybody asked me this question, we're not changing the goalposts while we're still trying to get to there. So 2% is our inflation target. Importantly, we have a ample reserves regime that we're still trying to hit. We're not you know, abandoning our ample reserves regime at this point. And all the things that people have come to depend on as part of Fed policy are still there. Resolute to keep our inflation target and resolute to do that um, with why we balance the the uh, the labor market, which is incredibly important. Well, Mary, you know I'm a big fan and advocate of nominal GDP I targeting. I do know that. And I, I was at a conference where you and a number of other Fed presidents were giving talks. And I remember Jim Bullard gave a talk on nominal GDP targeting. He was, I know, one of the big champions inside the FOMC for nominal GDP targeting. He has since stepped down. Are there any champions left for nominal GDP targeting at the Fed? So you know what, uh, and I'm going to, I don't usually speak about my colleagues, but I'm going to speak about us collectively. 
So here's something that I really love about working at the Fed, and you can, you know, I know Jim had a, a model. He had, that was the model that says, imagine people live 200 quarters, and you know, how do we how do we go through that? Um, but but seriously, you know, all these things are, are useful to think about. There's nominal GDP targeting. There's price level targeting. There's inflation targeting. There's a dual mandate, right? Some countries are inflation targeters. We're a dual mandate country, and what's important is that the, the goals are always the same. These are how to achieve the goals. The goals are to create the, a sustainable growth, a healthy growth rate that is not too fast, not too slow against the potential output, and do that with having a, a price level or a price or inflation rate that is stable and low and a labor market where people who want jobs can get them. Right. And those are the goals, no matter which technique or, or methodology are you using. And so we looked at all of those in the last framework review and came to the one we use, which is inflation um, and dual mandate our goals, inflation at 2 percent and a labor market that has full employment. I still think that's a, a really winning proposition. It served us well. But I, I gave you that sticker. You know, I am curious I, I, I am a policymaker and a researcher and voraciously curious. And so if people come and say, look, I have price level targeting or nominal GDP targeting, could have produced a better outcome? Well, then obviously we would think about those and consider those things. But there's always advocates for all the different ways. And the, sure. the goal is to try to get something that works for as many Americans as possible. And there's two other things to the curious so be voraciously curious. This is useful for younger people, too, is that you're doing anything, just be voraciously curious. When I'm looking to hire people, I look for curiosity. And I also look for, okay, I've been very curious. Now you need to take a decision. I want people to be confident in that decision. But then immediately upon taking it, I want a certain amount of humility, right, to say, I sh what did I miss? How do I get curious again? So I have a sticker. It says, be curious, be confident, be humble. And that actually is the way that I think the framework review will go. And all of my colleagues share. I don't know if they have my sticker, but I'm happy to give it to them. But the, uh, but the most important thing is we all share that, that mindset of we've got to be curious. We've got to be confident that we've looked at everything. But we also have to be humble enough to ask again, is this the right thing to do? Should we do something different? Well, great. Well, we are putting together a uh, policy brief series on the Fed framework reviews. We'll Hopefully Terrific. Time. Send it. Yeah. And of course, it has a certain angle to it, so I look forward to you. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think otherwise, right? But yeah, I, I think it's is it titled uh, a nominal GDP target. It is. It's, it is. It's something along those lines. So well, we I, I mean, I'd be anxious to talk to you about it as, as we yeah, do the framework yeah. review. Well, I'll be happy to talk to anyone at the Fed who wants to talk about it. <laughs> um, a few minutes left before we go to the audience. Uh, what, one last question from me. And, and I need to be careful how I ask this, but we're going into an election year, and, and things get political. Everything gets political. Um, and, you know, President Trump can say some things about the Fed, um, as well as other candidates. How do you operate in an environment like this? How do you keep your eyes on the target when you've got a lot of noise and distraction around you? So the, so the Fed is really just what we say we are. We're not political. We're apolitical. We just don't think about politics because, you know, the, the chair said this on his 60-minute interview, and it, but it's something that all of us say is that integrity is our most important attribute and trust of the American people. And the trust that they have and even Congress has in us is that we achieve our goals and we work to achieve our goals. And we can't take politics and political changes into the conversation. I mean, our job is hard enough frankly, to get the price stability, full employment part right and make sure that people can live their lives and livelihoods without thinking about inflation or that there could be a, a recession in the labor market. So, you know, you asked how do we do it? It is just the, you have to almost sign a secret, you know, the, the thing, if that sort of say at the beginning of your tenure, we're not going to think about politics because it is an apolitical position that Congress has asked us to take, which is full employment, price stability, those are our goals. That's what we're going to work on to achieve. And that's really what I think about. Okay. We will now turn it over to the audience for questions. And as Vin mentioned, if, if you're on this side, please walk behind the cameras to the microphones over here and line up uh, behind the mics. And we'll take as many questions as we can within the hour. 
Hi, <clears throat> Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for taking our questions. Just following up a little bit on the labor market, you mentioned initial jobless claims today came in a bit higher than expected. The job mar- job report last week was a little cool. So my question is, if the labor market does look like it's getting weaker, would that be enough for you to be in favor of cutting rates, even if inflation were still a little bit sticky? So the way I would put it, it's a great question, an important question. So the way I would put it is that there's a difference in getting softer and being weak. And if the labor market starts to falter or looks like it's getting weak, well, then absolutely that's one of the the things that would cause me to say we need to rebalance the policy rate as long as we're not seeing inflation skyrocket. You know, those are trade-off decisions. So I don't want to work in the exact, I don't want to lay out a matrix of hypotheticals and tell you exactly what would be done on anything because we haven't faced that situation. But I think there is a real conversation to be had here on your question of a softening labor market right now would just be getting back to what we think is normal growth, right? You still have, we can have a view that like 110, 120,000 jobs a month is, is what the economy can absorb at any one time that we're outgrowing that even with the the slightly softer or below expectations report we had last Friday. And so you do see it cooling, but that's what we should expect to see, right? The policy rate's high. We're trying to bring the economy back into a more sustainable growth path, whether that's GDP growth or the labor market, and we want to bring inflation down. But the the very most important thing to re, to, to remember is that we have two mandates price stability and full employment. And right now we have a strong and healthy labor market, but absolutely have to keep an eye on that, continue to watch. So I'd say the the recent readings, I have my eye on it, but I'm not yet worried. Just to pin you down a tiny bit. Oh yes, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, what would that look like? how high would the unemployment get where you'd be like, huh, okay, this has got to look at So this. I'm not trying to obfuscate or avoid the question. I, I really am not. It's just very challenging to think in hypotheticals because it's, you could write up a little map of what, and this is what rules do or models do. They write up little maps of when you would do which action. But honestly, what happens is you have to balance a lot of things in that moment that we don't know, that don't fit into that matrix of the nexus between inflation and unemployment. So let me, let me explain. So if we saw that inflation was coming down and, or we had a lot of signals that consumer spending was weakening and the labor market was starting to get Um, challenged. Well, that would be a different situation than if we saw a couple of ticks up in the unemployment rate, but inflation still going strong, consumers aren't budging in terms of their willingness to spend, investments taking place. I mean, those are, you can't really write down a, a little matrix of inflation, unemployment, and say, when would you act? But we do have the mandate to also take care of the labor market. And if the labor market would start to falter in some fundamental way, well, then policy actions would have to be different than if it wasn't faltering. I mean, I, you know, I go back, I, I'm, this isn't the, an answer to the question, but I'm going to give it anyway, because it really, I think, will help you understand how I come to this table. So if I may tell a little story about my, so I came up in a family where, um, you know, both my parents uh, were, we were in a lower, lower middle income, well, lower middle income family, and the whole neighborhood, uh, my community, had, we lived in houses where you'd put a card table, which is just a fold-up table, if you don't know what a card table is. It's a little fold-up table. you put that in the living room, and you'd do th- all kinds of things on it. But one of the things you, everybody in my community did was pay bills on Sundays. And in the late 70s, the high inflation, they stacks of bills that they couldn't pay, no matter what house I went to, including my own, was always taller than the stacks of bills you could pay. And then the Volcker disinflation came, and... My parents and all the parents around my community lost their jobs and they couldn't pay for anything. And so that story of seeing people struggle on the treadmill, it was kind of an indignity, right? You're working, you're doing everything and the inflation's just outstripping you and you, that's demoralizing to almost everybody. Then you have to do something that causes the labor market to really falter. And now people, you've given them one thing that's better, lower inflation, but you've taken their, their livelihoods, which leaves them equally, well, you know, not well off. So I have that in my mind. 
and that is the balancing act. And it's why I resist the idea that we want to put this in some sort of a box, like an equation, and instead say, we have two mandates, and we have to be extraordinarily careful in managing those two mandates. Inflation to 2% over time, and a labor market that continues to deliver jobs and opportunities to people. That's what we're trying for. I still believe we can do it, but it takes constant work, and we can't declare victory on either side of that right now. Steph Miller, I'm uh, with the financial regulation team, and I'm an economist by training, and most of my work is on banking and crises. And I would say the predominant views within that literature are, was it a liquidity problem, the, the bank failures from last year? Was it a liquidity problem? Uh, there was the run, or was it a solvency problem? and therefore was capital sufficient. I, I tend to take the latter view. That's my takeaway from the data I've worked with. And so, but given your broad background, I was wondering, what, what was your overall take on what, what happened last year? So let me just be sure, you, you think it was a capital problem? Yes, okay. insufficient. Yes, and it, I think that you know, ultimately when, when you have bank failures and bank stresses, both are up for thinking about, right, capital and liquidity. But one of the salient components of the, the SVB failure and then Signature and First Republic and then the stresses that persisted was the ability to tr translate capital into liquidity. So I think the liquidity piece was a new piece that when people were thinking about why would a bank fail, that liquidity piece was really salient. And it was salient because for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of the part of their portfolio is held in the held to maturity part, which isn't marked to market for banks of a certain size. And so investors suddenly got transparency on that. And as you saw, the bank stocks that were affected by that went way down. And so I think that's a liquidity issue. I think the other thing that happened is we realized how quickly people can move money and how willing they are to move money. And, you know, if you think of Basel, the difference in the weights internationally and certainly domestically was not that large between insured deposits and uninsured deposits. And what we realized in those bank failures is that that gap is much wider. That if you're not insured, you're going to move if you think your bank is under stress. And that can happen rapidly because you can move money on your phone and other things. So there's a lot of lessons that can come from those three banks. Um, but I think it, I don't think it would be fair to say that it was only capital or only liquidity. It's really, the question is, is the banking system sound and resilient? And I, I will remind everyone in the room for, who, don't, who doesn't study banking that we have over 4,500 banks in the United States and three failed. So the big message is banks are, are sound and resilient. They're used to managing these types of risks. But in these worlds, you can absolutely have pressures on liquidity and capital that, that matter, and, and we have to rethink those things. I don't make that kind of policy. As a Reserve Bank president, I have a role in regulatory policy. But I certainly, as an economist and a, as a person doing policy, understand the stresses and the impact they can have on the economy. So absolutely great question. Thank you. Uh, uh as host, I want to give Craig a chance on the microphone. He's a journalist visiting here, so we want to give the journalists a chance to ask their questions, too. President Daly, and this is also for you, David. Um, today, I opened my fancy Bloomberg, and I saw that since Jay gave the press conference, bond yields fell, the dollar fell, stocks rose, and financial conditions eased, none of which should have happened if you're the chair saying, uh, I'm going to hold for longer. So um, I'm humble. I'm curious. Not that confident that what I learned in macro is working today. So why do you think that happened? So let me, I think that it's a, it's a good question because it, it shows the complexity of the situation we're in. So financial conditions move around based on a variety of things. What the Fed says, what they think will happen on the economy and on inflation, their forecast, their own forecasts and projections, what's happening globally. And what you see is it's been moving around a lot on data points, and importantly, data points that suggest it might go one way or another way. And 
you know, we got a, a, a weaker than expected job market report, although not weak. I'm back to the, the first question. It was a softer jobs report than many expected, but it wasn't weak. It was still a, a, a reasonable jobs report. We got initial claims printing a little higher than the expectation. So there's always this thought, well, maybe the economy is weakening more than we thought. Earnings on, on some major companies were below expectations. Those things all feed into how investors, market participants, are thinking about the economy's direction. But one of the jobs of the Fed, and I take this part of the job seriously, is we have to stay steady in the boat, right? If you you could, there were many who got, I think, overly optimistic on the inflation front with the second half of last year when inflation was throwing, falling pretty rapidly. That proved to not be a durable uh, decline. And so that study in the boat proved to be helpful. Right now we've got two pieces of labor market information that look below expectations, but not especially weak. And so we'll have to absolutely have to continue to watch that. But I think it's far too early to declare that the labor market is fragile or faltering. We just have to continue to watch. And this is where, to David, your earlier question, this is where or your earlier point, that data dependence is really um, not data point dependence. It's really the, the whole, you know, I, I'm a microeconomist by training, a macroeconomist by practice. But what in either one of those, what you learn is the preponderance of evidence is your best guide, not a specific piece of evidence. You can easily over rotate on a specific piece of evidence and find yourself making, you know, policy mistakes. So I think this study in the boat uh, approach is, is 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 the right one. And and just to lean against the the one thing you said, I don't think I don't think in an event study. It, you can just look at press conferences or commentary by the Fed because other things happen in the intermediate period. And if people are understanding our reaction function, then they should be adjusting depending on how the information is coming out and what they're seeing. But again, sometimes markets, et cetera, can over and under react to information in a way that that we might just stay smoother in that, but that's because we have to look at all the risks as well. We are not just, you know, betting on one outcome or another. We have to look at the full range of risks and plan the scenarios that we would uh, use in those risks. Mary, if, before I turn it back over to the audience, just going back to your comment earlier on the bank question, how it's tough to turn capital into liquidity. There's been a big push for using the collateral banks have at the discount window more readily to, to use it to meet liquidity requirements. This would solve a lot of problems, or at least some of the problems. Where do you see that conversation going? So, you, you know, definitely uh, banks making sure that they're signed up for the discount window. This is a longstanding tool. This is not something that is brand new. You know, banks use the discount window on a regular basis. And the the idea that many people are putting forward, and it's it's a very useful one to consider, is maybe use it more frequently. But that will take more work and effort. And the first part is getting banks signed up who aren't signed up. And certainly all reserve banks have been um, always encouraging their banks to sign up for the discount window. But it's the push is obviously uh, much more intense at this point to just sign up for it, make sure you know how to use it, make sure you've tested it, et cetera. I do think that this is a fundamental question that you know we have to ask about how do we provide liquidity in a rapidly changing world? And we have the federal home loan banks and we have the discount window and we have other, you know, non-institutional sources of funding that wholesale funding that banks can get. But it is a it is a very important question. And back to the capital question, it's not one that I think was getting a, garnering a lot of attention prior to the failure of those three banks where they're they really couldn't get liquidity fast enough. Okay, let's go to the audience. Hi, uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Thanks both for doing this. Really interesting. Um, two things real quick. One is a follow-up to Nancy's question. Uh, there's a big gap from 175,000 175, jobs a month down to 100. Uh, do you think that's going to be adequate to uh, continue disinflation, or is it going to have to get even weaker with a consequent rise in the unemployment rate? And then secondly, from December through March, everyone was saying if the economy evolves as we expect. It'll likely be appropriate to lower rates this year. Do you think that statement's still true? Are rate cuts still likely this year? So uh, let's go back to the labor market. I, you know, I do think that we're seeing, in a really positive way, 
disinflation, I mean, just think about where we were last year at the start and where we are now. Inflation's come down a lot. I mean, a lot. And that's because of a variety of factors. One is monetary policy that has slowed demand. There's no doubt that things are slower now than they were. If you ask the contacts and firms, et cetera, they're going to say early last year it was very frothy. It looked like we were riding a bicycle down a hill with, and we lost control of the pedals, right? It was just really frothy. Now it's back to something that seems more normal. In fact, one of my contacts said, this looks like 2019 except for that inflation part. So I think there's a sense that the economy is in a more, on a more stable footing. So the question, Howard, is you know, do we have to really push the economy down? And I don't see evidence of that just yet. I, don't, you know, I certainly um, don't want to rule things out, but I don't see evidence of that right now because we're getting positive supply. There's still supply recovery and supply inc- improvements in in output across the board and AI and other things could certainly help that, but just people are making investments. The other thing that's happening is we had a really positive labor supply uh, boost, both from increases in participation between 25 and 54 year olds, which I no longer am comfortable calling prime age. I used to be really comfortable calling that prime age. <laughs> now I'm completely not comfortable. So, uh, but but it really that middle group, you know, especially for women who came back in, and then we had um, immigration flows, which continued to boost our labor supply. So those are things that are positive that help us get the inflation down without that. And also there's this behavior of consumers. I think we can't overlook this. Inflation expectations are well anchored. And that's across the board. And consumers at some point, especially when they've spent down their excess savings and other things, are just become more price sensitive. And that price sensitivity means that firms can't just reflexively pass things on. And that's the beauty of a well-anchored inflation expectations environment. So to, to answer your question specifically, Howard, I don't see that we have to cause more pain to get this to happen. I see this as happening as we, as we move it down. Disinflation is incurring. We've had three stubborn months of data, but I still see monetary policy is working and supply cooperating. On the, on the rate cuts, rate hikes, rate, rate stays the same. I'm going to go back to the scenario analysis and say I really am holding myself because I think it's the best thing to communicate to the fact that what's happened is the confidence bands. Remember we said we want to be confident that inflation's on a sustainable path to 2%. I have that still is my metric because confidence is, is for me what it means is the confidence bands around my our projections get narrower and narrower. The first three months of the year made them wider than I came into the, to the year with and so I didn't grow more confident but I'm going to be looking at that, and those are still the goals, right? Ultimately, the reaction function is get inflation down to 2% over time. Uh, don't stop in our policy until, we're there, until we get that. We are confident that that is underway, but also watch if the labor market is starting to falter because that is another part of the equation. At this point, both of our mandated goals are in the frame, and we have to attend to both of them. Uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Brian Knight. I am not an economist. I'm just a lawyer, so bear with me. But I love lawyers. I, I, I had a, I had a, I'm a, the only person in America who says that, by the way. I, I like to think my wife loves at least one lawyer. Oh, okay. There but, you but, go. Uh, so I guess the question I had, based on my colleague uh, Steph's question, is you, you mentioned that it's sort of a, a, a liquidity problem, but were the assets actually difficult to sell, or were they difficult to sell at a sufficient price to cover the bank's liabilities and then the second follow-up question is, you, you mentioned that like we had three banks fail, and that's evidence of a, of a good stable banking system. But we also had a fire drill among the government and the Fed rolling out new emergency policies and all this stuff, at, which kind of had a whiff of 08 about it. So do you think that was an overreaction, or was that sort of prophylactic to make certain that problems didn't arise, but that was a threat, or, or, or what was going on there? So. You know, so this is just fully my vantage point. I want to make sure I don't speak for any of my colleagues on this. This is me looking at the the things that you see in the economy. So March, I don't see March of 2023 looking like 08 at all. 08 was a a really challenging time. People were carrying their stuff out of their companies in boxes. People were losing their homes and things. It was it was a very distressing time. March of 2023 was, a, was a, a, a big awareness that not only the largest banks can cause systemic risk, 
right? That there's a systemic. So if, if this SVB was a not a small bank, but it wasn't a, a, a big bank either. And there was a, a sort of a sense that maybe smaller banks couldn't cause contagion or systemic risk across other banks. But what you saw is that because it was a liquidity issue, they had assets, but those assets hadn't been marked to market as they've evolved, that when those assets are marked to market because you have to raise liquidity, you suddenly don't have sufficient liquidity or capital to fund your deposits. That is something that all then banks who look like that who had underwater securities, underwater loans, because they priced them at low interest rate environments and now the interest rates had risen. That was the awareness that I think made this a more of a systemic risk. And so the actions that government took, the Treasury Secretary and the Treasury Department and uh, the FDIC and the Board of Governors, those actions, to my mind, were really a welcomed uh, settling, putting, saying, yes, this is three banks that had that problem, but we are going to ensure that the rest of the banking system remains safe and sound. I mean, on those days, having lived through a couple of these situations in my time at the Fed, on those days, the very most important thing is to assure Americans and others that their money is safe and sound in the banking system so that you don't cause a greater run, which is really problematic. And, you know, that did not happen. Banks didn't have counterparty risk with each other. They didn't, you know, think of 08. I mean, there was a fear about you didn't know what your counterparties had, so you weren't lending. I mean, that was a completely different situation, and at least in my judgment. I think the history books will, will characterize it as such. Okay, we are at the end. Before we close, we want to recognize that you are now... Can I get that young guy? You, want to, you, want, you have time for one more? I do. Okay. You've been standing so patiently, and you're bringing up the uh, younger end of the age distribution, well, so... I'll mention Chris is one of our research associates, and he's starting the PhD program in economics in the fall. So. I'm so glad I took your question. Uh, what do you think about the fiscal theory of the price level? Ooh. Ooh. Wow. I, you're, okay. Well, now we'll can, see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. So, you know, here's what I think about is that it is easy to discount or get on a particular view and say that view is the view and should be the view or that view is, isn't the view and should never be the view. And I think that's at our peril. So we should be open minded, in my judgment, to all different ways of thinking about the world and then ask ourselves, what are the learnings from those ways of thinking about it that might influence us? doesn't mean because you've listened to it and studied it and evaluated it, you'll accept it. But I do think that closing off debate is the best way to find yourself uh, in, an, in an echo chamber of your own thinking or the prisoner of your own particular uh, way of thinking about things. And I, I just think that's never going to be good for, for societies. That's why we do the framework review every five years. Um, I get a lot of people emailing me about the fiscal theory of the price level. I get a lot of people emailing me about nominal GDP targeting, uh, price level targeting, uh, a single mandate. And what I learned from all of those is that it's good to have people thinking about how to manage the economy and um, the, the, the mandates we have uh, in, a more, in a better way. And I'll, I'll, I'll read anything, at least once. <laughs> well, Mary, before you go, you're now a member of the macro musings family oh wow we give out mugs so every morning you you drink from this you'll see nominal gdp targeting on there <laughs> and uh, you know you haven't sold it all that well by uh, <laughs> okay and you know if, if you ever feel the urge to travel to washington dc for fomc meeting and bring this with you i'd encourage you to do that and <laughs> drink it in front of your fellow I fomc did have somebody members give me a, a, a fiscal theory uh t-shirt once I've, I've acquired a lot of different theory t-shirts, but I don't okay. have a theory mug. There you go. So there, there we go. go. Next okay. level. Let's give a hand for Mary Daly.